So I, I mentioned at the outset of this session how um, Lorenz's work um, helps make um, problems of nonlinear dynamics of interest to elementary physics. And I think um, here at MIT, this is perhaps no better exemplified than in the work of Jeff Gore, the next speaker, um, who will talk about um, problems of um, stability in ecological communities. And Jeff is an assistant, no, he's no longer an assistant professor. He must be an associate professor by now in, uh, in the Department of Physics here at MIT. All right, uh, well, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Although, I have to say, it's uh, quite difficult to follow Lydia because she has all these amazing movies. Of course, they're somewhere in between, between amazing and terrifying, right? And uh, I, she, has, she didn't actually show you, I think, some of her uh, most terrifying videos. The first talk that I ever saw her give was at, uh, at, our, at our biophysics retreat. I was organizing it, so I invited her to come and speak as a new biophysics faculty. And, one of the videos was, you know, these like high power industrial toilets. So they, you know, she has this, <laughs> she had this, this slow, you know, slow mo movie of, you know, it, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave it, leave it to your, exactly, leave it to your imagination. But um, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's great to be here. I, um, unfortunately, I never got the chance to meet uh, either uh, Charney uh, nor Lawrence, but uh, their work has uh, certainly been very influential in the way that. Uh, that I view the world, and also in uh, several of the projects that we've pursued in the group. So what I wanted to do is uh, kind of tell the story of kind of, of what, in particular, what Char uh, one of the things that Charney worked on and how uh, that has influenced some of the, uh, the work that is going on well, around the world and in particular in, in my group. Uh, all right, so the story starts uh, when Charney went on sabbatical uh, in the early 70s. So he went to several different locations, but uh, one of them uh, was uh, to Israel where he was at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, in Israel, one of the things that you know they think about is desertification, and, uh, and this uh, presumably is how uh, Charney started again uh, thinking about this question. And uh, and we heard uh, earlier today a wonderful talk by uh, Fathi, where he told us uh, in, in some depth about uh, Charney's ideas here. So I'll just remind uh, you guys of of what what he found. So he was uh, so Charney was interested in this question of whether desertification could be somehow a self-reinforcing phenomenon. Right. To what degree might there be some positive feedback loops that could lead desertification to be somehow uh, maybe even an alternative stable state to uh, the savanna state? Right. And the, the basic idea uh, behind uh, Charney's proposed mechanism is this one here that's on top, and there's another one you can, if you're curious on the bottom. But the idea is that if, you, if there's some sort of loss of vegetation, then this will alter the albedo, sorry, this, this alters how much of the light is reflected back into the, uh, into the atmosphere, right? So in particular, the desert is more reflective, right? And that's gonna alter the, you know, the flow of air. In particular, it can then make it more dry in that region. So it can reduce precipitation. And of course, if you have less precipitation, then that will also come back and further decrease the amount of uh, vegetation within uh, that region. All right, so there's this uh, possible positive feedback loop that Charney studied in, uh, and published in a number of papers uh, in the mid-70s uh, using a combination of, um, of simulations and other kind of work. Uh, in, uh, and as you can see, that there are other possible positive feedback loops. Right? In particular, one thing that many other researchers have focused on is the role of erosion. Right? So if you have uh, if you have a loss of vegetation, then uh, you'll have more erosion, and that can, again, feedback. Okay. Right, and indeed, if, uh, if researchers have looked uh, at the Sahal region uh, within Africa and have seen that there is evidence that even though in maybe the amount of, uh, in this case, the insulation, right, so the, how much sunlight's coming in, even though that could be some sort of slowly changing variable, then there's some evidence that within the Sahel there was a sudden transition from uh, what you might say is a, a nice uh, vegetated kind of uh, habitat to perhaps um, the, the desert that we, uh, that we see uh, within some of this region today. Right, so the idea is that when you have these positive feedback loops, there can in principle be alternative states between a desert state and, uh, and a vegetated state and associated with that a sudden transition between these states. Now, this idea of sudden transitions as a result of positive feedback is quite general, not just in the context of desertification, where uh, 
Charney studied it, but indeed throughout many different uh, natural systems. And one of the things that we've been thinking about is how these sorts of dynamics can take place at the level of populations and later in terms of ecosystems, like the desertification. And so just as an example of another population where there are positive feedback loops, uh, we, we all are familiar with these sorts of uh, images and movies of schooling fish and their behavior. And of course, uh, there are many uh, reasons that fish might do this, but one of them is just that it may help avoid, for example, predation. All right, so this is a case where uh, individuals benefit from the presence of other individuals in the population, possibly because of avoiding predation. And it's that kind of positive feedback loop that within, say, fish populations that can lead, again, to sudden uh, transitions. And for example, this is uh, data from the Newfoundland cod fishery, so just the cod fishery up the coast uh, to the north. What's being plotted is the number of fish that were caught as a function of time. And what you can see is that this was a very productive fishery for, uh, back here, this is 1850, and indeed for, uh, for hundreds of years uh, b before this. So very productive fishery, but then in the 60s and 70s, improved fishing technology led to a dramatic increase in the number of fish that were caught, and that increase in fishing led in the early 90s to a catastrophic collapse of that fishery. All right, so although we haven't been fishing here for the last 20 years, only now are there tentative signs of recovery. Right. So it's highlighting that when there are positive feedback loops, you can get sudden transitions. Right. So I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, some uh, ongoing work uh, within uh, the field having to do with the, these sudden transitions. In particular, there's something uh, known as bifurcation theory that can provide some in insight into these tipping points. And in particular, there are possible early warning indicators that these tipping points may be approaching. Right? One thing that has been proposed and that we've been measuring in the group is that there's a change in principle in the fluctuations in the size of the population or the other, uh, other variables of the system before the system transitions, before one of these tipping points. Okay? Uh, and uh, this is something that we've been studying in the lab just using uh, microscopic organisms. Right, so the way that we often think about these sorts of transitions is that if you look at the population size as a function of the environmental condi condition with deterioration on your right, what can happen is that as the environment deteriorates, the population size decreases as you would expect. However, it may be that the population size doesn't smoothly go to, go to zero, but instead what can happen is there can be a catastrophic collapse of that population. Right, so at some critical level of the environment, you can have a sudden collapse of the population. It could be local extinction or a transition to some other, for now, we'll say undesirable state of the system. Right, so this could be, for example, the desertification transition that Charney was, uh, was studying. Okay. Now, let's say that you see desertification. You might say, oh, well, let's just, uh, let's just plant a few more trees and maybe we can get back to where we started. But things may not be so simple because it may be that you have to come all the way over here to this point on the left before you can get recovery. Right, so what's happening is that there's somehow memory in the system. Right, so once you get this desert transition, it can be very difficult to get back to the grassland. Okay. And what's happening is that at this intermediate environmental condition, the system can be bistable. Right, so there can be two stable states of that system. And in general, what you expect is there should be some unstable state denoted by this dashed line that's telling us, in this case, about, for example, the minimal size of the population required to come back up to that healthy state. So this is known as a fold bifurcation because these states somehow fold over on each other. And it's the basic mechanism that was, uh, that was explored by Charney and also the basic mechanism that is thought to lead to sudden transitions in a wide variety of these complex systems. Okay, now in many of these situations, what you would like to know is that you're approaching that tipping point before you cross it, right? Because after it becomes a desert, again, it can be very difficult to get it back to where you wanted it to be. So what's interesting is that from general ideas in nonlinear dynamics, there are, in principle, universal behaviors of these complex systems as we approach these tipping points, right, that point F2. All right, to get an idea of why this might be, what I'm just going to do is show um, what the effective potential looks like far from the tipping point in green or close to the tipping point in red. So what we're going to do is we're just going to rotate things. So now I'm going to plot the effective potential as a function of this population size. Right, but in the co context of desertification, this would be, for example, how much plant cover there is uh, in the region. Okay. Right, and so what this looks like is, um, far from the tipping point here, is like this. So this effective potential is telling us about how the system responds to a perturbation. What you can see is that if you get perturbed away from your equilibrium here, you quickly come back to your equilibrium state. 
However, as we get close to that tipping point, that effective potential looks very different. It's much broader. So this says that any perturbation away from equilibrium like this will take a long time to go away. Right? So this is why this phenomenon is called critical slowing down, because as we get close to the tipping point, the system is slower to, get re to recover from perturbations. In addition to that, just the natural noise in the system, you would expect to kind of build up, and you expect that the fluctuations in the system should actually be growing as we get closer to that tipping point. Right? Not only should they grow in size, but they should also get slower. All right, so the, the expectation, just to remind ourselves, okay, that as we get close to one of these tipping points, leading to collapse of the population or desertification, what you expect is there should be a change in the fluctuations of the system. They should get larger and slower. All right, so this is uh, something that two of my, uh, well, one of my permanent students and a visiting student set out for themselves to ask, all right, could we actually measure these things in an experimental system where we can really turn the knobs, measure things explicitly, and see what happens? And so what they decided to do is to use my, a microbial population, budding yeast, where, uh, again, there are many different examples of these positive feedback loops, cases where the population engages in some collective behavior that benefits the entire population. In our case, what we, uh, we're using is just these yeast that are collectively growing on the sugar sucrose. It's common table sugar. Right, so what happens is that these yeasts, they secrete out the enzyme that breaks down that sugar, just cuts, up a, sing cuts a single bond, and that allows the entire population to grow on the, uh, the resulting uh, byproducts. Okay? And indeed, what we can measure is that the yeast will divide more rapidly at higher cell density. Okay? And that's what leads to this possibility of a sudden collapse because of that positive feedback. All right, so just so you know what the experiments are kind of looking like, I'll, I want to be concrete. What we do is we start with some low density of cells in liquid. We let them divide over the course of a day. At the end of the day, we measure how many cells there are just by looking to see how cloudy the liquid is. Okay. Then we perform a daily dilution where we just transfer over a small fraction of the cells into fresh liquid with fresh sugar and everything else. All right, and then what we're going to do is just measure the size of the population or the density over time and look to see how it responds and ultimately measure the fluctuations in that density. So the first thing we did is we just asked, well, is it really the case that these yeast, when dil diluting by this 1400 each day, is it bistable? Does the fate of the population depend upon the starting density of the cells? And experimentally in the lab, this is something that's easy to do. We start with many different densities of cells and then we just propagate all of these populations in the same environment. And indeed, what you can see is that if we start with high density of cells, those populations, they all survive. They reach some stable state. If we start at low density, however, those populations, they go extinct to another stable state. So this could be like grassland, and this is like desert, a desert. And in between, there's some unstable state that's a minimal viable density for survival. Okay. And so what we can then do is we can ask, well, let's, we can just plot the density that's stable, the minimal density for survival, Again, zero was a stable state here, extinction. And that was at a particular dilution factor. That's just diluting by some amount. All right, what we can then ask is, well, is there a fold bifurcation in the system? To address that, what we can do is we can repeat the previous experiment, but we can just vary how much we're diluting by. This is something like environmental harshness or mortality. All right, so if we do that experiment, what we get is uh, what I think is really a beautiful fold bifurcation in this very simple yeast population that is embodying the same basic dynamics that are thought to occur within the region of the Sahel. Right, so here we have a stable state up top where the density shrinks as the environment deteriorates. This is the minimal viable density for survival, and that's growing, as you would expect. Uh, and over here is the uh, tipping point that leads to collapse of that population. Okay. And now the reason that we wanted to start this experiment, though, is we wanted to ask, well, is there any way that we could measure, we could anticipate that we're approaching that tipping point just by looking at the fluctuations, right? So th this would be analogous to some sort of early warning indicator in the context of a population that we care about, or maybe the desert, right? So first, what we did is we measured the size of the fluctuations, right? So this is the coefficient of variation, so the standard deviation divided by the mean. What you can see is that in a benign condition here, the fluctuations are only a couple percent. However, as we get close to that tipping point, there's quite a dramatic increase in kind of the size of the fluctuations. Right? So this is telling us that we could use this as an early warning indicator that we're approaching that tipping point, and we could sound the alarm before we cross it. In addition to the size of the fluctuations, we can look at also the time scale of the fluctuations. They were supposed to get slower 
Uh, and indeed, uh, that's also possible to see. We can quantify that by the autocorrelation time. Right? How long does a typical fluctuation take to go away? Right? And what you can see is that in a benign condition, the typical time scale of the fluctuations are just a couple days. But as we get close to the bifurcation, the fluctuations become much slower. So I just want to summarize what, uh, what, we've been, uh, what we've been seeing or exploring. All right, so just like within the context of uh, the feedback networks within the Sahel, if we have positive feedback within a population, then there can be a catastrophic collapse, transition to another uh, alternative stable state. What we found is that uh, these theoretically proposed early warning indicators, uh, they can in principle be measured uh, in simple experimental systems, and we and others have been exploring this in various natural populations, like natural plant populations that are closer uh, to what Charney explored as well. Um, and more generally, I think uh, my group is just excited by this idea that these experimentally tractable laboratory microcosms are a powerful window into the emergent dynamics that can take place as a result of uh, feedback loops. Uh, and with that, I'll thank the group, who are the ones that actually do the work, and I'm happy, happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Does your microorganism system work with human population? Yes, all right. That's, so, uh, 10 you're, billion or 20 billion the Earth's your Yes, class. all right. So you're, you're wondering whether there's a tipping point in human populations, right? Yeah. So this is, uh, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that are, that's, you can argue about over beers, but then, you know, when you're being recorded, you, always, you, know, you always want to watch what you say. All right, so there, you know, of course, people, um, people are thinking about this question. I, um, and and cer it is certainly possible that, well, it's certainly the case that humans have a lot of positive feedback loops and that uh, there would, for example, you know, the, you know, all of these post-apocalyptic scenarios, if, you, if there was a virus that came and killed 99% of us, then the 1% that were left would not, they wouldn't be able to run everything and they would be in trouble, right? So in that sense, we, we definitely have the, the basic thing of the positive feedback loops, but that doesn't mean that the environmental de deterioration that's taking place is of severe enough quality to overwhelm the advances in technology and so forth. So I guess I tend to be an optimist in terms of, in terms of that question, uh, but we should still avoid horrible flu pandemics and sneezing on each other. Yeah, and toilets, yeah. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> the uh, full bifurcations are just one form of bifurcation. And in, um, in spatially distributed systems, or even in just temporal systems, you have hop bifurcations, yeah. bifurcations to different modes of spatial or temporal variability, like we've seen in other talks For here. Sure. To what extent? Do we, uh, do we know about precursors uh, of tipping points when, when it's not a simple fold bifurcation? Yes, uh, so this is an, a very important question. Uh, yeah, and we, we and others have been uh, interested in a whole variety of bifurcations and systems and so forth. Uh, so we have been able to measure uh, these early warning indicators before a hop bifurcation because, again, this is another zero eigenvalue bifurcation, so it has the same basic features. Uh, some of the global bifurcations are, are more subtle, though. Um, in addition, um, we have explored a variety of spatial patterns before collapse of the population. Indeed, uh, we have shown both in the lab and now in collaboration with, with field ecologists that we can measure uh, the spatial analog of recovery time. Right, so at a boundary between regions of different quality, it takes longer to get recovery uh, when you're approaching one of these tipping points. In, longer in terms of space. You have to get further away from the boundary before you come to equilibrium. So we, uh, so yeah, we've been thinking about uh, you know, a whole, this was just the first paper of a set of many. Yeah. One of your early slides, you showed the cod population in Canada. Yeah. What, what should we have done for them. All right, so yeah, so I'm not an expert on fisheries, I should say that now, but, uh, right, but there's this idea of a maximal sustainable yield of a fishery or other natural resource, right? So if you want to maximize the number of fish that you can catch kind of out into infinity, then you don't want to push it so hard that you cause it to collapse, right? So of course, in the context of fisheries, uh, every few years, the fisheries, uh, fishery boards 
they, issue, they decide how many phishing permits to give, right? And I think that to the, the first order answer is just that we have to make sure that we don't push a fishery, we don't harvest from the fishery too much. Uh, but then we, we have to be careful about improvements in technology to, you know, and so forth, yeah. Thank you. Yep. There is a, a, a concept which is very important of carrying capacity. Uh, is, yep. is, can, be, can it be used for, for this purpose? Uh, yeah, so the question is about the carrying capacity. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, in the context of the fo uh, fold bifurcation, what's the, the carrying capacity as a function of the environment is in some ways just that equilibrium population size. Right, so given some amount of hunting or fishing or whatnot, there's some equilibrium size of the population, and you would normally maybe even just call that the carrying capacity given that environment. But then if there's a fold bifurcation, the idea is that the population looks like it might be healthy, but then all of a sudden collapses. That's right, so in, th in that sense, the carrying capacity is dynamic. Although, it, you know, beyond that fold bifurcation, there's no non-zero carrying capacity. There's, you know, so it could just be that Extinction is the only stable state beyond that bifurcation. Is that? Okay. Okay, let's thank Jeff again.